Okay, safety is really quite dull, isn't it? So I'll try and make this as entertaining as I can as we go. Um, you may or may not have noticed that there's almost no open source software um, in safety critical systems. There's a, a lot of attention on proprietary solutions uh, and bespoke custom solutions for specific situations. Um, I'm going to try and explain why that is uh, and also some work that CodeThink is, is doing to try to fix it, particularly for um, Linux-based software, um, but also more generally for open source. So the work that we're doing is not just about taking one Linux operating system and, and trying to certify that. It's about how we would do that systematically. So here goes. So I'm going to talk a bit about safety, um, what, what people think of as safety. Uh, then I'm going to talk about certification, which is somewhat different from that. And then I'm going to talk about our method, which we're calling Raffia, because it's nice and catchy, and hopefully people will remember it. Uh, then some of the things we've learned, and then where we're going from here. So um, people talk about safety-critical systems or safety-relevant systems. That's, that's broadly systems that could, harm, could cause harm if they did something wrong or are expressly trying to prevent harm happening. Um, these days, loads of those systems require software. I don't know if you've realized, but pretty much all of the safety critical systems in your car these days have been driven by software since pretty much the 80s, right? So drive-by wire was happening from the 80s onwards. Um, these days, every time you press the brake pedal, the software telling the braking, um, whether it's a disc or whatever it is, to, to actually do the braking. So we've been relying on software to achieve safety for a very long time. Um, but these days, we're trying to make safety demands of much more complex systems. So it's one thing to do a microcontroller serving a braking system. It's quite another to munch all of this software, including a whole load of AI machine learning models into a big multi-core processor and then hope that that's safe. So we're, we're you know, we're on a journey, aren't we? Um, as I said, most, most of these systems, most of these solutions that, that claim to be safe are proprietary, and there, there are good reasons so far why open source has not, not been properly considered, I would say. So um, when we get to an organization trying to make safety claims, um, they, they can say, oh, we think we're safe, but then someone's going to look from outside and say, how do you think you're safe? Why do you think you're safe? And that will boil down to, have you complied with standards? And there are a whole plethora of standards. The kind of parent standard of them all is this ISO 61508. I'm sure that most of you here haven't read it because it costs 2,000 euros or something to, to buy a copy for your personal use. So I'd be very surprised. ISO 26262 is cheaper. I think it's only about a grand. But you can see already why that there's um, little interest from open source people. Why, would, why on earth would we pay um, to access that, that stuff, which was written by guys some decades ago now. Um, but I'm not saying the standards are completely useless. They're not. They have lots of interesting uh, ideas in them and, lot, and lots of well-learned um, lessons from, from big systems and, and complex systems in multiple industries. Um, but in practice, to read the standards, digest them, and then figure out how you're going to adapt all of your stuff to, to satisfy them. Um, it's a big undertaking. It tends to be done by commercial organizations. Uh, and you end up with VxWorks, QNX, Integrity. So Greenhills and QNX are st still very active. Uh, Windriver is still very active. Um, and they kind of have a, a, a domination of the safety critical operating systems market broadly. Um, and you ask, why isn't Linux or, or, or Zephyr even at the moment being um, used in safety, and the, the real answer ultimately, when people will say, oh, it changes too fast, or it, it's too big, or whatever, but what they'll really boil down to if you push them hard is, well, it's not certified. We can't use that. Um, now, ISO 26262 um, is a standard that particularly relates to automotive, and for those who don't know, CodeThink is relatively active in automotive. About half our work is with automotive OEMs, so the people that make cars and sell them. Uh, with the tier ones who supply systems to those companies. Um, so this standard determines whether um, something is safe for use in a, an automotive system. And it not only specifies things about software, it specifies things about how you would manage software, how you'd engineer it. So it's a whole load of stuff about processes. And again, open source, I categorically assert that most of the open source projects in the world have little, little to no interest in complying with the kind of processes that were invented by those guys contributing to an ISO standard some decades ago. 
really, a lot of the processes that they, they specified were waterfall. They predated Git. They predated CICD, right? So it's just a shitload of paperwork, which frankly no one these days has much interest in. Um, but still, I, as I say, there are some valuable things to, to glean from those standards. It's just it's very hard to make open source align with them. Um, think about certification. Certification is not safety. Um, certification is someone independent, someone qualified, someone who understands the standard, comes in, looks at your process, your, the way you're working, your, your software, and gives you an assessment that says, oh, yes, we agree with your assertion that this is safe. But frankly, we could get a certificate for a no-op for some software that did nothing, provided the process was right and the management was right and the, and the coding standard was followed. Right? Um, in practice, in automotive, and Arm, Arm did a, a, a research project into this, and um, I'm going to quote Chris Temple from Arm, who last year said that they looked at a, an actual automotive pro project and found that there were 100 different certified safety components. Each of those components makes its own assumptions of use, which is pretty much saying, oh, and you've got to do this stuff safely, because we're not doing that. So imagine bringing 100, 100 of these things together, and someone has got to wrestle with all of those assumptions and try to make a safe thing out of the result. I, it tends not to be um, as easy as it seems from just putting together 100 things that are certified safe. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to name names today. Normally I do name names and I swear more than I'm going to swear today, but I can see that the camera is on, so I'm going to try to avoid it. Um, we could, if we were so inclined, certify a microkernel, couldn't we? And then we could say that it does these things absolutely safely guaranteed. But then we could exclude all of the drivers, couldn't we? And then we could have a viable business which could actually dominate an industry. That is the state of play today. Kind of ridiculous, but that is the, the position. Um, now, ISO 262 demands that you have um, requirements, architecture, traceability between the requirements, the architecture and the code, and code analysis. So right at the end, you know, as we've been on our journey, we discover that um, ideally ISO 262 would like a description for every single file that contains C code showing what it does and how, it, how, it, how it's intended to work. Imagine the gargantuan task that would face us trying to retrofit all of that stuff to Linux, just the kernel, never mind the whole operating system. So um, it's a lot of hard work. Um, now, uh, in practice, there is at least one example where an organization has done that. Uh, there's a company called Wittenstein, I think. They took FreeRTOS, which I'm not sure how many lines of code is, it is, but it's not very many. And they went through a process of, in effect, reverse engineering or retrofitting all of this documentation, and they achieved something which they call safe, safer or safe RTOS. Um, there was a vulnerability in FreeRTOS's network stack. I, I did ask Wittenstein in public whether SaferTOS had already established and fixed that vulnerability, but the, no one replied, so I don't know. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Uh, so, where people have tried to certify Linux, they've mostly failed. The few successes have taken a spe very specific version of Linux and hardened it, you know, chopped a whole load of stuff out or turned stuff off. And then they specifically say you can only use this subset of, of the functionality. So it's kind of a, a crippled but guaranteed version of Linux Lite. Um, where people tried to do the whole thing, um, the, the scale of the task has, un, has overwhelmed multiple teams. Um, there are, there's some work. I think Red Hat and others are in the process of um, working on this PaaS, uh, which is an addendum, in effect, or, or a, a revision to try to bring new practices, but that's a long way away from uh, becoming uh, accepted. So at the moment we're stuck with in automotive, ISO 26262 is how we would mark our homework. And as I said, it's, it was written so long before and it, it really does not take into account, even the 2018 version still does not take into account things like Git and CICD, I'm afraid. So um, from our point of view as software engineers, we can categorically say that we would take our modern techniques over your old paperwork any day of the week, but um, I've given up trying to argue with people about standards in public because they don't like me. So um, just to get this point across, I've shown these diagrams before, but I'm going to do it again. So when, when originally the thinking that led to safety standards and safety certification was, was happening, this was the kind of picture. So we would have some certified tools making some certified software. 
Um, more than 20 years ago, we ended up with this kind of situation where there's a shitload, sorry, I've sworn, a shitload of um, software which is not certified in the environment and also another humongous load of software which is not certified in the target. And now we're into that plus all of this virtualization, hypervisor nonsense and machine learning. So good luck on claiming that your whole thing is safe, right? So from Kothik's point of view, that, that whole certification stuff is kind of a sideshow. We are software engineers. We, we're helping customers to deliver real product and we know that it is impo important, so we're trying to do the right thing from a software engineering point of view. Um, apparently, uh, this idea of the Romans or, or, or the um, ancient bri bridge builders being required to sleep under their bridges is apocryphal. Right? So it didn't really happen, but it's a, a good concept. Right? So we internally in coding do talk about, we're not aiming for certification. Certification is a byproduct. We want to actually believe from a software engineering point of view that we have a safe solution. Okay? And that actually has allowed us to, first of all, avoid the traps that the standard might lead people into, but also it's given us a, str a strength of purpose and a, a belief which allows us to push back when, we, when the standard is demanding stuff that we think, you know, clearly it's not necessary. And to be fair, um, the standards do allow for, if, you, if you've got a better way of doing some, something, then document it and, and explain why, and, and that can be considered. So um, that's, the, in effect, the path that we're on. Okay, so Raffia, as I said, hopefully a catchy name, people will remember it. Um, it's specifically an approach for dealing with huge software, software that's connected, and therefore because it's connected, it's going to be subject to potentially security uh, implications, and we might need to update it in the field quite frequently. Um, it's specifically taking into account that a lot of the stuff that we're going to use is open source, uh, as well as custom software, and it takes into account that the kind of projects we see, the software is never finished, so it's going to be developed on an ongoing basis, and that means we would need to make the safety argument on an ongoing basis. We need no point in certifying something once and then, you know, three months later, this, everything gets updated and our safety argument is defeated. That would be a shame since it's still going into a car. Um, and the other thing we have to handle is multiple suppliers, so open source plus vendors of this, that, and the other. Um, we know for sure that um, traditional safety engineering approaches don't get to this scale. We were asked about this by Bosch in 2016. And we have literally been walking slowly on this journey ever since trying to understand how we would help Bosch and others to make safety problems uh, pro promises around this scale of software. As of this talk, I think it's the first time I can actually say that, and I'll show you why, um, we believe we'll get an ISO 26262 cert for a Linux-based operating system. So uh, just to give you a broad understanding of what Raffia is, um, it, it's more things than just risk analysis, fault injection, and automation, which is how I originally coined the, the term. Um, but the others, as you can see, we can't pronounce. So it's a combination of risk analysis, and we, we achieve that via STPA. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with STPA um, at this point. There, there are lots of presentations online about STPA. It, it's a methodology established by MIT. Um, there are some problems with it for software. It's, it's not really designed for software specifically, so we've we had to do a lot of work ar around how to make STPA work for us in our, our specific scenario. We combine that with testing to verify that the risks we identify don't, get, uh, don't occur. We then use fault injection to prove that our tests work and that we can cause the risks that we've identified to happen, and then we can use the results of that to see what the implications are, what mitigations might need to to be taken against the potential that the software misbehaves. Because ultimately, we're not aiming for bug-free software. Uh, you know, that ship sailed decades ago, right? Uh, oh, and by the way, on the code coverage stuff, total nonsense, I'm afraid. You know, you can have 100% coverage and clearly still not be actually testing anything, right? Just because you, you put a test in to say this code path happens does not mean it does the right thing when it happens. Uh, and we see many projects crippled by hitting that coverage metric so people end up writing as much test code as the target code, but no one's testing the test code, so who knows? Um, so um, in order to satisfy the standard, whatever approach you take, you've got to generate evidence to support your assertions. So that becomes then a, a big part of the work. You know, we, we establish a reason why we think we can be safe, and then we, ha we need to demonstrate that we're complying with our assertions of how we work. So, great thing is we've got CICD, so we can automate most of that. Um, 
SDPR, I said I won't bore you, so I won't. Um, I'll just leave this. Uh, the slides will be published afterwards, uh, obviously. Um, and uh, as I said, there's plenty of uh, resources around for STPA. Um, and at the point that we, we get to where we're going this year, we expect to make our detailed explanations of how we use STPA and how Raffia works, um, open source and, and public as well. So, um, but broadly, it's, it's a structured approach where you start by defining what you, you care about, and then you work through a, a modeling exercise to get to what, what are the key outputs of this, which are unsafe control actions, things that if they happen, then harm ensures or hazards, hazard, hazards are uh, triggered. And then that leads to um, analysis which we can use to form the basis of automated testing. That's a crucial thing. Um, in practice, automated testing means we need to be able to verify the behavior of software at all, all, all expected states, so during startup, during shutdown, uh, under stress, uh, as well as normal operation. So this leads to a load of automated stress testing, in effect, uh, and also we need to break those tests on a regular basis to prove that the tests are really doing what we, we say we do, uh, say they do. Um, th I have to tell this story. Um, back in 2011 or 12 it was, we were working on an automotive project and every day there was a test results email got sent around. You know, test results, test results, test results. After about six weeks, one of our guys opened up the email, was interested to see, and it was just a spreadsheet. Clicks on the spreadsheet and there's only one cell filled, up, filled in. And the cell says, Valgrind not found. <laughs> so, so we need to know that the tests actually do what we think they're doing and that the, that the results are, are what we think they are. So we use fault injections um, as a way of checking our homework, effectively. Um, and I've talked previously about how trivial it is to do fault injection. Any, any software you give me, if you give me the source code and say, oh, it definitely does this, I am absolutely sure that I or one of my brighter colleagues can break it within one just by changing one line of code. We can definitely make it not fulfill the promises. So we can use that principle to check our tests and also to generate broken versions of the software to explore whether our mitigations later in the process work. And we think that's innovative um, and our certifying authority has confirmed as far as they're aware, no one has taken that systematic approach to software at scale in this safety context before. So, so that's, I think, the key trick that we're using to, to maybe break the logjam. Um, I've talked about that, so I'll skip. How am I doing for time? Oh, good. Um, so compliance. Now, historically, uh, compliance means you get uh, someone reviewing your work, and they will ask for your requirement specifications, your design architecture, your test results, all, all of this stuff, and then there'll be an ongoing engagement to, to review and, and assess. And that's, frankly, where we are still at today, um, working with Exeter, who we're, we're very comfortable with now. We, we spent some years with them on, on figuring out the, the wrinkles of this process. We did achieve an ACLD tool certification for our tooling and, and some of the core integration approach in 2021. And one of the good things about that proof point was that we managed to do that by, with, without even bothering about whether the software was open source or not. In effect, it's GitLab and a combination, combination of techniques that um, we, we learned from and, and um, have applied since uh, the Reproducible Builds project. Um, the fact that it's open source is just not relevant. We, we managed to demonstrate that the result is what matters and we, we could use the results to, to verify. We, we could also use the results of, of that discipline to confirm whether anything in our tooling changing was going to actually affect our output. So reproducibility gives us a clear checkpoint to say, if we want to change anything, do we still get the same results as we used to? So that's, that's been a, a great trick. Um, so the compliance process now, we're, we're working towards continuous compliance, and I know other organizations have made claims about that. Um, that's going to require changes on, on both sides of this equation. Exeter is, we would assert, among uh, approximately the state of the art of, of safety and cybersecurity certification. Um, they are still heavily manual and relying on um, interviews and, and reviewing manual documents. So they're not yet at the point where they offer an API, which we push all this stuff into. But I would suggest within a few years, that's where everyone would want to be. We'd want to be having a standard way of presenting evidence and, and, and getting assessment mostly automated so that the experts can focus on understanding whether the argument really holds up 
and doing spot checks to work out whether the, the, the things are lying or not. Um, so I've made it sound simple, haven't I? It's not quite simple. That, so that's um, a reasonable picture of the kind of approach we're taking. As you can see, there's a whole load of stuff ends up in Git. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of, all of the steps. All I would say is that it's normal CICD, but plus risk analysis for safety and then some extra steps around fault injection and automated testing for mitigations, as I've said. Okay. Uh, everyone get a picture of that? Good. Okay. Um, then uh, we recognize that iteration is, is bound to happen. You know, we can't get anything right first time. And I, I still come across, you know, certainly on mailing lists, people saying, oh, yes, we deliver software um, right first time. Fantastic. I just, don't, I just never met you, so I'm not sure that what you're saying is true. Uh, I've been doing software since the early 80s, and I've never worked on a project where it was done right first time. And I, I'm surrounded by people who are great at code think, but most of the things we've done, we've ended up doing multiple times and learning from what we did. So iteration is, is inbuilt. We have to expect that. So um, we go through this process repeatedly. Um, I've been known to be a, a strong um, detractor of Scrum, because I do think a lot of that stuff was just bullshit again. Um, it's fantastic having a five to nine person process for your five to nine person team. But when you took it to Nokia with 5,000 people and then screwed them up by making their Scrum, um, what is it, product owners, or Scrum masters, be in 11 stand up meetings every day because they're managing a Scrum of Scrums of Scrums of Scrums, you know, it's just nonsense. So can we get real? Uh, but, oh, yes? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm a, I've always been a supplier. Right? But I know lots of people from Nokia, and, and uh, so I, I made a, a huge software services sale to Nokia in 1999. I'm an old guy. Right? So yes, I, I know where the bodies are buried, there and in lots of other companies, I'm afraid. Anyway, so iteration, I, I, I digress, don't I? Um, iteration is unavoidable, and we need to reapply this process on an ongoing basis. We, we are working at um, two-week sprints, and that seems to be... Um, giving us good results. I think one week would not give us enough time to, to learn the lessons from each time. Um, we're still wrestling with how, uh, how we get to sufficiency. So, and I won't uh, be able to talk about that today. We have some other kind of parallel strands to try to get us to a quantitative review of what our actual risks are, because it may not be obvious from all of this, but what this really boils down to is risk management, right? No, no amount of certification or safety process or anything else guarantees that there won't be a problem. And if you think about automotive, all automotive OEMs have to con contend with their cars are involved in accidents every year, and some of the people involved in those accidents claim that the car is at fault as opposed to the driver, and they, they almost certainly have a, a case. So there will be these lawsuits, people harmed by cars, and the question is how to manage the risk of that overall. You know, it's, we're not guaranteeing that software is, is never going to be at fault. The question is how often is it going to be at fault? How much is it going to cost per incident? So this is all about risk management in the end. And sufficiency really boils down to figuring out how to minimize the risk to a level that it's acceptable or, or, or it's, it's defensible. And defensible and acceptable will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It's, it's a function of what the law is state, stating in a given country. Okay, so um, just briefly, uh, this is the, s some stuff from our current ongoing project. We're calling it Zaysan. Um, by the time we uh, kind of start engaging with customers, Zaysan is not the name that we'll be using, but it, it's our code name. And that's a lake in Kazakhstan, I, I had to ask. Um, so at the top right, you can see the, uh, the control st um, structure diagram from SDPA. This, we use that as the basis for the modeling. And then the modeling leads us to some structured YAML, which defines, in effect, all of the safety requirements, and we, and we work down from there. So everything that we're doing ends up in YAML, and then we can parse that and use it to trigger automated tests and, and generate all of the compliance documentation and everything else. Um, same thing for the uh, test analysis and fault injection. So uh, we use the YAML to... Keep, keep track of all of the tests and also to do the traceability so we can parse this and, and generate the matrix that people would require to see whether we've actually complied with what we said we were going to do. Um, 
We do a combination of pre-merge testing and post-merge testing. Um, and this, again, is, is practice that we've had to learn and, and evolve in, in, in reality with our customers. Um, has everyone here heard of trunk-based development? Hold up your hands if you have. Very few, excellent, okay. The reason I'm saying it's excellent is because that's a very widespread paradigm for cloud-based and IT type systems. The idea is that you have to land your changes every day into mainline so you don't have long-lived branches. Unfortunately, we've, we've seen a, a couple of customers that have tried to bring that to embedded in car software. And because testing for some of this stuff takes way longer than a day, if you keep landing in mainline, then you have something which is never working because it's always broken. You know, you get the results two days down and say, no, no, sorry, your, your change didn't work. So trunk-based development is no good for this. So you have to combine some pre-merge stuff which is not going to be complete with some post-merge stuff, and just keep on, keep on landing stuff every day in mainline is, is not a safe way of, of working. So, uh, shall I skip? Oh, no, I won't talk about this. So, the actual use case we're using, and actually I should, I should have mentioned this earlier, our, one of the other things that we're doing as a way of constraining the work we do, we're not trying to constrain the versions of Linux, or the number of APIs that we can use, but we are saying we need to know what the use case is. We're not gonna aim for generic safety, you can do whatever you like with Linux and, and it'll all be fine. We're saying, give us a real case where you need Linux to do something. So we chose <coughs> this rear-facing camera application. So in effect, anyone that drives a car knows these days, instead of just having a mirror, which clearly doesn't have any software, so is unlikely to break due to a bug, um, we're going to have a camera and then we're going to have it on the screen in front of us and we're going to use the video feed as a, a surrogate for the camera. So that application is safety relevant. And we're doing, we've done the risk analysis for that and we've, we've ended up with an architecture and tests and fault, and, uh, fault injections and mitigations for around that specific topic. And this thing at the bottom, one of the things is we need to be sure that the camera feed gets to the display and that the lag between the camera feed and the display is small enough. So, you know, if, if you get a frozen um, screen or a, a frozen frame, that's exactly the problem that could lead to someone being hit. Because if, you, if you're showing an empty drive and then a, a kid runs across the, the back of the car, then that's, you, you had your one job and you, you screwed it up. So um, we found some open source software which generates a real-time clock as, as a, a bitmap, um, and we're using that. This gives us also a verification that what's getting onto this display is readable, because we, we, can, we can actually confirm that the clock signal is, is, is still um, interpretable as a clock signal. And we're using that as part of our soak testing and our overall test framework to verify that what we send in through the camera input um, is arriving at the display output at the right, the right time without, without um, excessive lag. Um, then we're combining that with gathering of, of the information, the gathering the data over an extended period of time. And I don't think you can see the, the guts of these um, pictures, but it's, it's broadly plotting latency and, and plotting failures over time and then looking for trends and working out what is triggering the exceptions. So we, um, we've already gone through, again, with iterations, we, we established that a lot of our early problems were not down to the target system, it was down to our test environment. You know, things that we thought were working and looked like they were working most of the time, but you run it over, over some days and you start realizing you get these occasional spikes. And when we drill in, nothing to do with the target. It's all about the system testing environment. So we, we fix those over time and, and those graphs get better. Um, where we, from the tests, identify situations where the actual software is not behaving as required for the safety case, then we either have bugs or limitations which need to be managed either by fixing the software, which we expect will be quite rare because we've chosen well-established open source, um, or it may require changes to um, components. We might, we might find we're using the wrong approach. Um, you know, I, I think some people still have a religious ongoing war about system D versus everything else. You know, So far, I categorically can tell you we've not found any reason to say that system D is not fit for this purpose. We're, we're sticking with system D. Um, it, in some cases, it may not be possible to fix the defects. We may need other mitigations, right? You know, certainly the, one of the things, if you're running soft, one piece of software on one system and the system crashes, 
then you will need a mitigation that's outside that system, right? So everyone needs to understand that. Um, okay, here's some lessons. Let me just check how long time. Okay, so um, first of all, STPA. When I first heard about this, I thought, wow, this is great. This is going to literally save us because I was kind of at the point, we'd, we'd done some discussion with lots of people in public around how you would make this kind of promise. And I was starting to think, this is just too big. There is no way of, of dealing with, with safety. And then STPA was brought to my attention. Someone, someone mentioned it. And it's a top-down approach, which means I don't have to look at all of the lines of code. Right? And it gives me a way of reasoning about the risk from the top level. And, and the claim was, oh, it's going to be a lot less work than traditional approaches. So fantastic. I'm, I'm all for that. Um, we started, we did a, a public investigation with MIT in a project called AVSDPA. You can find that on, on uh, GitLab. And it kind of worked. We did the first level SDPA, and we identified some, some real hazards. But we, we kind of ran out of steam because the guys argued, well, we've done this one level, but that's not enough. We're going to need to do level two. And level two will be that much work. And then there were some people saying it, we might even have to do level three, which would be from, you know, to the end of Prague. So, um, so we, we stopped because we weren't sure how far we needed to go. But we, we did actually manage to cause the work that, um, the, the project that this was aligned to, to stop. So we did actually potentially save some people from harm because there was a plan to take some vehicles, put this Apollo um, autonomous vehicle software into vehicles and run them around Vegas at CES. And we, we, we and MIT categorically demonstrated in two different ways that that was a stupid thing to do, so it didn't happen. Um, we then did another project, the first attempt of what is now um, the, the Zaysan initiative. Um, and the STPA particularly bogged us down. The question was, how do we know what our scope is? How do we know that we're applying STPA? How do we know that our analysis is correct? How much analysis is enough? And how do, how do we know we're even analyzing the right things? And you know, software engineers, as I'm sure most of you know, either directly or through, through working with them, um, we tend to worry about making sure we know what we're doing, you know, because you know, corner cases can kill us. Um, trying to interpret this very wordy description of STPA and be sure that we got it right hard for software engineers. Um, third attempt, frankly, uh, it, it came down to distilling the STPA and saying procedurally we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and this, and this, and only that. So rather than boiling the ocean, it was let's just do STPA once, one level, and see what results we get. And I noticed that the team got halfway through that and then started, oh, we're going to have to do level two. I said, have you finished level one yet? No. Then finish level one. So eventually, the team stuck with it uh, over multiple iterations, and we get to a full level one analysis, which is a huge value, because now we have a, a thorough assessment of the risks and some loss scenarios which we can generate tests for. So our current thinking is we don't need to keep doing level two, level three because we can use different methods against that from the bottom up. And that seems to be working. So we're, um, we already get a lot of value from the automated tests and the fault injection to probe whether our analysis is holding up. We can map all of the results that we find back and see whether is anything exposing something we missed in our analysis. And so far, the results are good. Um, and a final lesson I would suggest for this morning is that um, tying up all of the paperwork is still a huge amount of work. You know, saying CICD is, is going to solve it magically, yeah, it, mostly it does. But you, you've got to do all of the work of plugging all of, all of these mappings together. Once we've done that the first time, it will clearly be a lot less um, for subsequent certifications. So we do think we, we gain the benefit of the, the ongoing um, process speed up. Um, and here's where we are at now. I'm just checking for time. Have I got five minutes? Is that right? Yes. Okay, so uh, we work with Exeter. Um, for those who don't know, Exeter is, uh, we, we would assert, um, a very well-established uh, certifying authority. They provide consultancy on safety as well. They're all around the world. We work with them in the US and in Germany particularly. And um, they've been doing that for 20 or 25 years. So um, they're, they're very well-established, particularly in, in, in the industry that, that we care about. Um, 
we are we've been working on this specific iteration for 18 months i would say it's a team of around about 10 people in, in total um, which is large for codethink but when we discuss that and say how far we've got with our customers um, their jaws drop at times um, we've been building on the tools that we uh, certified a couple of years ago and we you know we're, we're confident that we, we're on a path now to, to achieving this and this year we've started literally just in the last weeks we, we've received commitment to go ahead with a proof of concept with one of our first customers so things are so far looking good and I checked with Exeter that they were happy for me to share this they they did our first safety assessment uh, in April this year and this is what they said to our customer um, so they've done the preliminary uh, functional safety assessment they've done written uh, they've had written responses to their questions and they've analyzed them they think that the system level analysis is very solid and they they were keen to point out that in general they find that people aren't doing that because the way the standards work people are driven to certify this component certify this component and once you've got enough ticks in those boxes then oh you, you guys just make it work now because it's safe right which is flawed um, so the fact that we're calling that out and showing a way to deal with it um, is where the, I, think, I think there's some real innovation and, and some, some chance for better sanity and, and, and more progress. And they said fault injection needs some clarification. The reason for that is just that the standard places very strict guidance on what a fault injection is, and we're using fault injection for way more than that. Right? So we're using fault injection to probe as many different things as we can. So they, in effect, they're just saying that using that, those words, we need to call it out and explain what we mean by that. And the key thing is they, they believe, and they, they believe when they did the assessment, that we are on a route to certification, and they're hoping that we can achieve that in time for their symposium in October this year. So we're very excited about that. I will finish by saying, I don't have a slide for this, that our intention is that all of Raffia will be open source. Um, We'd, we could have done all this in the open from the start, but why would we? First of all, we'll just get a, a lot of people saying, oh, that's crap. And second, um, there's a reason why most people don't publish their SDPA analyses. Um, I asked MIT, you know, we were talking about uh, autonomous vehicles. I said, you, they said, they've done, done this about five or six times. I said, oh, great, can you share your SDPA? Because I expect it'll all be the same, because we're on the same planet. You know, same laws in the different countries, same weather, same, same vehicles, so you, you would you would end up with the same result. Oh, yes, but no one will allow us to publish. Why not? Well, because it exposes risk. It ex exposes them to liabilities. So um, we were breaking ground to do the AVSDPA analysis in public because we did it open source from the get-go. But we're a tiny company. I really don't need Wild and Dog in large um, operating systems companies hurling crap at us at the moment. So by the time we open, we'll, we'll be able to defend by saying, look, we've used this to certify two things now, and we want the open source community organizations to take an interest, sorry, to take an interest in this. Um, categorically, I don't see how an open source project on its own would normally want to do certification, because it's just exposing a whole lot of risk that, that nobody would need. It's got to be done by companies that have a commercial interest in managing the risk. Right? So we're certainly wanting to encourage companies to take up this process and, and get to safer solutions with open source. But I'm not expecting a flurry of, oh, you know, Yocto is certified or, or Linux kernel is, safe, is certified. Because I'm pretty sure, and Kate can, can correct me if I'm wrong, Linux Foundation won't want to be on the hook for, for making those promises. It's got to be the organizations making product that carry the can for making those promises. Okay, so that was it. Thank you. Any questions? Paul, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're using mainly the SDPA, and you have been in discussion with, with Succeeda. Does the SD, or is the SDPA sufficient because typically the questions come on, have you done a fault tree analysis, have you done an FMEA, yeah. and that's what I typically hear in automotive. So they say, these are the masters, SDPA is new, can it replace a traditional FMEA or fault tree analysis? 
Uh, well, our position is that, yes, it clearly can, because we, we don't need to do those alternatives. Um, that doesn't mean that, it, that there might be no value in running those methods as well. So one of the things we've, we've established is having someone else look at the problem from a different perspective may always give us some new value. So we're not saying don't do fault tree analysis or bow tie or whatever it is, but we don't believe we need it to make the promises that we're making. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any more questions? One here. Are you familiar with, there's a, you, you talk about how do you stop testing, how do you know when you stop, stop testing? The mm -hmm. only thing I know that's really somewhat objective is something that I've run into with uh, telephone companies, I know AT&T, Nokia mm -hmm. have used these, where they have a, they, they assume a constant testing rate and then a, from that they, they oops, hold on, <laughs> they, they predict uh, basically a defect back backlog curve which mm -hmm. rises as they do testing and then tapers off as things are actually fixed. Yep. Um, which is, it has its, it has its limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly doesn't work well for small organizations just because the statistics aren't there. True. Are there other objective ways that can, I mean, the, the only other thing I've seen companies use is they just say we will have no more than you know, one serious bug and three not so serious bugs. Mm -hmm. is, is there anything else that, that we can use? So we, we have a couple of, uh, I mentioned that we've got a couple of other paths because this is just risk management to a certain extent. The, the main path is what I've been describing today. Um, we have a research project underway trying to identify um, appropriate metrics for open source projects in general and, and particularly the open source projects that we are hoping to make safety claims about. So that will look at large scale statistics. And the, the great thing about open source there is the data is available, right? So we can, with scripts, gather bug rates and, and you know, if, if we can establish those, the kind of trends you've, you've mentioned, then that'll be great. Um, obviously there's false positives there or, or false negatives because there's loads of bugs that are not relevant to the hardware we've chosen or, or, or the, the specific version. Um, the other path that um, we're on. We, we've engaged with uh, an organisation that specialises in quantitative risk management. So this is a company called Hubbard Decision Research. They're relatively small, but they're very well established. They've been doing this for decades. And literally, the, the brief we've set them is: Can you help us figure out how we would measure the risk for this this kind of situation, and also how how you could measure the value? You know, what, what risk reduction we get from these measures. So we've, we're identifying all of the measures we're taking, and then we're trying to put dollar values against those versus the risks. So um, I would say that's not a solved problem, but we're, we're on paths to, to assess that. Yeah, thanks for the question. Any more questions? There is one question online. Okay, it's not about um, code coverage, is it? <laughs> no. Let's see. Are you targeting to certify against any aviation standards such as DO 178C, DO 330? Yeah. So um, our approach at the moment is to focus on automotive because we have a, a number of customers in that industry that are, are really interested. But absolutely, the hope is that we can broaden from there. So um, the trick is to establish a method that we can show works in one place and then build out. So it's not. We're not thinking about that today, but you know, with a trailing wind, maybe next year or the year after. And certainly, we'd, we'd welcome interest from people in those industries. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, one more here. Do you have the time? Yes. Just a sec. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Run, run, run. <laughs> yep. Yep. Great. I'm in one of those industries. Oh, super. Okay. Uh, we don't use DO 178 because uh, that's specifically for human rated vehicles and, and ours okay. is, is uh, unpiloted. But um, uh, when you talk about code injection, one of the mantras that happens a lot in the launch services uh, development area is uh, fly as, uh, test as you fly and fly as you test. The tricky thing there is uh, you, to do fault injection, you do have to make an exception. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I mean, we do make exceptions. You just have to, mm -hmm. to, to do uh, good testing. But um, any thoughts on making that as painless as possible? It's, it's a totally valid point, obviously, because you, from our point of view, we want to have broken versions of the software, and we want to slip them into people's testing to check whether they're really testing, right? But we can't do that if it's going to actually put, cause a, a risk to humans. So, so we have to weigh that up. So no, I don't, I don't think we've got any magic bullet there. But we are worrying about exactly that, that topic. You know, we would, we would want fault injection as far as possible down that. And we certainly would want it, in our use case, in vehicles, you know, on a test track without, you know, when we can simulate the, the reality of, of, of the, the real environment. It should be possible to, to use fault injection all that way. Once you're flying, I think it's, <laughs> it's harder. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for the questions. Okay, thanks a lot, folks. Thank <laughs> you.